Eight-year-old girl from Vallejo who defied all odds by escaping a kidnapper who had already killed at least two other girls. In the quiet town of Vallejo, California, the sun cast its warm rays on a seemingly ordinary day. But beneath the facade of tranquility, darkness loomed. It was a day that would forever alter the lives of two young girls, their families, and the community. This is the chilling tale of Mincy Sanchez, the girl who escaped, and the relentless pursuit of justice. Twelve years earlier, the streets of Pinole, California were filled with the innocent laughter of seven-year-old Amber Swartz Garcia. But in a cruel twist of fate, she vanished without a trace, abducted in broad daylight. Despite years of tireless searching, her fate remained unknown. The community mourned haunted by the echoes of a lost child. Then, on a fateful day in December 1999, the heart-wrenching cycle repeated itself. Seven-year-old Sienna Fairchild went missing after being seen talking to a man at a Vallejo gas station. The relentless search for Sienna yielded no answers, leaving her family in a state of perpetual anguish. The state of California trembled in fear as the serial killer unleashed his reign of terror upon the innocent. Eight victims already fallen prey to his sadistic desires, leaving the community gripped by terror and uncertainty. With each passing day, the question loomed, who would be his next target? August 12, 2000 was meant to be a day of celebration for Midsea Sanchez. It was her eighth birthday, filled with promises of joy and love. But fate had a different plan in store. As the sun set on that ill-fated day, Midsy's life took a horrifying turn. As Midsy made her way home from school, unaware of the lurking danger, a man intercepted her path. His deceptive charm masked his sinister intentions. He claimed to be injured, needing her help. Innocence compelled her to approach, but a gut feeling sent shivers down her spine. And in a blink of an eye, her world shattered. For two agonizing days, Midsy became a captive in the clutches of a sadistic predator. Bound by fear and subjected to unspeakable horrors, she fought to preserve her spirit amid the darkness. Her will to survive flickered like a fragile flame, and she endured the unimaginable. Within the confines of the abductor's car, Midsy's hope waned. She longed for her family, for the safety of her home. With every passing minute, her resilience and determination were tested. But deep within, a spark of defiance burned bright, refusing to be extinguished. On the brink of despair, Midsy seized a fleeting opportunity for freedom. With bravery born of desperation, she defied her captor's threats and seized the moment to escape. With every ounce of strength she could muster, she leaped out of the moving vehicle and into the unknown. Her body battered, her spirit bruised, Midsy stumbled onto the road, a beacon of resilience amidst the darkness. Desperate for help, she flagged down a passing truck, her tear-stained face pleading for salvation. And in that moment, fate intervened once more. Carl Tafua, the driver of the truck, became an unexpected hero in Midsy's harrowing journey. Sensing the urgency and danger, he acted swiftly, offering her sanctuary in his vehicle. As Midsy found refuge in the truck, a glimmer of hope ignited within her. Carl Tafua, a stranger-turned-guardian angel, drove her away from the clutches of her abductor. In that moment, the weight of the world lifted from her shoulders, replaced by a sense of safety and gratitude. With unwavering determination, Carl contacted the authorities, relaying crucial information that would lead to the capture of Midsy's abductor. The wheels of justice were set in motion as law enforcement launched a relentless pursuit to bring the perpetrator to account for his heinous crimes. Meanwhile, Midsy was reunited with her family, who had endured days of unimaginable anguish. Embraced by tearful embraces and words of solace, she felt the warmth of love enveloping her once more. But amidst the tears of joy, the scars of her ordeal remained, etching a permanent reminder of her indomitable spirit. As the community learned of Mitzi's harrowing escape, their collective breath caught in their throats. The darkness that had gripped their hearts for far too long was pierced by a ray of hope. 
Midsea became an embodiment of resilience, a symbol of defiance against the evil that had sought to break her spirit. The subsequent capture and prosecution of Midsea's abductor provided a small measure of solace to a community scarred by fear. Curtis Dean Anderson, a monster who had tormented innocent children, would face the full weight of justice. His arrest served as a turning point, a glimmer of justice in the face of unspeakable acts. In the courtroom, Midsey took her place on the witness stand, her voice unwavering as she recounted the horrors she had endured. Her testimony, laced with unyielding strength, left an indelible impact on all who listened. It was a pivotal moment, a chance for her to reclaim her power and ensure that her abductor would never harm another soul. Anderson's sentencing marked the end of his reign of terror as he was sentenced to an astonishing 251 years in prison. However, even behind bars, his twisted mind continued to taunt investigators and the families of his victims. In a shocking turn of events, Anderson confessed to yet another heinous crime. Twelve years prior, he had abducted and murdered seven-year-old Amber Swartz, snatching her from her own front yard. The revelation sent shockwaves through the community, reopening wounds and deepening the sorrow of Amber's loved ones. Desperate for some semblance of control, Anderson attempted to strike a deal with the police. He brazenly admitted to the kidnapping and murder of 13 other girls, adding to the already horrifying tally of his crimes. However, he cruelly refused to provide any further details without certain concessions. As Anderson languished behind bars, he faced the harsh reality of prison life. Surrounded by inmates who despised child predators, he lived in constant fear for his own safety. In his callous words, he acknowledged that his days were numbered, knowing that his fellow prisoners would seize any opportunity to exact their own form of justice. His refusal to cooperate denied closure to the families who desperately sought answers, and the secrets he held were buried with him. The anguish of those left behind remains, the pain of unanswered questions etched into their hearts. With the conclusion of Anderson's trial and the sentencing of this remorseless predator, the focus shifted to the survivors and their journey towards healing. Midsy Sanchez, the courageous young girl who escaped Anderson's clutches, emerged as a beacon of strength and resilience. Her story inspired countless others, giving hope to those who had endured their own traumas. Midsy's remarkable resilience led her to establish the Midsy Sanchez Foundation, a beacon of support for survivors of abduction and their families. Through her foundation, she offered resources, counseling, and a safe space for survivors to heal and reclaim their lives. Her unwavering dedication to the cause became a guiding light for others who sought solace and support. The community rallied around Midsea and her foundation, recognizing the critical importance of child safety and recovery. Together, they championed initiatives to raise awareness, educate communities, and prevent further abductions. Through their collective efforts, they strive to create a world where no child would ever have to experience the horrors that Midsea endured. While the scars of Anderson's crimes would forever remain, the survivors, their families, and the community as a whole refused to be defined by his evil deeds. They stood united, determined to honor the memory of the victims, support one another, and strive for a world where no child would ever have to experience such horrors again. As we conclude this gripping true crime journey, let us remember the strength and resilience of those affected by the unspeakable acts of Curtis Dean Anderson. May their stories continue to inspire us to be vigilant, to protect the innocent, and to support organizations like the Midsy Sanchez Foundation as they provide crucial support and healing for survivors and their families. The 1991 disappearance of J.C. Lee Dugard led to an intense search, but no results. J.C. Lee Dugard was born on May 3, 1980, in Arcadia, California. Her parents, Terry Probin and Carl Dugard, separated when she was just a toddler, and her mother remarried shortly after. J.C. grew up in a blended family with a younger half-sister named Shayna. They lived in the small community of South Lake Tahoe, California. Described as a shy and introverted child, JC had dreams of becoming a veterinarian or a professional gymnast. 
On the morning of June 10, 1991, JC's life was forever changed. She was walking to her school bus stop just a few blocks from her home when a car pulled up beside her. The driver, later identified as Philip Garrido, stunned her with a stun gun and dragged her into the car. His wife, Nancy Garrido, held her down as they sped away. JC's stepfather, Carl Probin, witnessed the abduction from the family's front porch and immediately called 911. This is 911. My daughter was just kidnapped. Top of the hill was a great fort. A man and a woman in the car. An extensive search was launched, but there was no trace of JC. Philip Garrido was a convicted sex offender with a long history of violence. In 1976, he kidnapped a young woman named Catherine Calloway and held her captive in a storage unit in Reno, Nevada. He was arrested and convicted, receiving a 50-year prison sentence. However, due to a legal loophole and perceived good behavior, Garrido was released on parole in 1988, just three years before JC's abduction. Nancy Garrido, on the other hand, had no criminal history. She met Philip while visiting her uncle in prison, where Philip was serving his sentence. They were married in 1981, and Nancy was fully aware of her husband's criminal past. Philip and Nancy Garrido brought JC to their home in Antioch, California, where they held her captive for 18 years. For the first few years, she was confined to a soundproof shed in the backyard with no access to the outside world. She was sexually assaulted by Philip and eventually gave birth to two daughters, both fathered by him. Over time, JC's living conditions slightly improved. She and her daughters were moved into a series of tents and shacks, also in the backyard. They were still hidden from public view by a tall fence and dense foliage. JC was forced to pretend that she was the girl's older sister and that Nancy was their mother. During her captivity, JC was subjected to Philip's psychotic delusions and religious ramblings. He claimed to hear voices and to be a chosen servant of God. JC later recounted that she had to play along with his beliefs to avoid further punishment. There were several missed opportunities in the investigation of JC's abduction. In 1991, during the initial search for JC, a neighbor reported strange sounds coming from the Garrido property. However, the police never followed up on the tip. In 1998, a neighbor called 911, reporting that Philip Garrido had young girls living in his backyard, but the responding officer never went beyond the front door. In 2006, Philip Garrido was visited by his parole officer, and Jay-Z's two daughters were present in the house. Despite their unusual living situation and Garrido's status as a registered sex offender, the parole officer failed to connect the dots. On August 24, 2009, Philip Garrido was spotted on the University of California Berkeley campus with Jay-Z's two daughters trying to pass out religious literature. His erratic behavior caught the attention of campus security, who ran a background check and discovered his status as a registered sex offender. They contacted Garrido's parole officer, who ordered him to come in for a meeting. On August 26, 2009, Philip arrived at the parole office with his wife Nancy, JC, and the two girls. Suspicion arose when JC introduced herself as Alyssa and appeared to be extremely nervous. After a series of questioning, JC finally revealed her true identity and the Garridos were arrested. JC was reunited with her family, and her story of survival and resilience captivated the world. She later testified against Philip and Nancy Garrido, leading to their convictions in 2011. Philip was sentenced to 431 years to life in prison, while Nancy received 36 years to life. JC went on to write a memoir, A Stolen Life, which became a bestseller. She also established the JAYC Foundation to support families recovering from abduction and traumatic experiences. In 2011, the state of California awarded JC a $20 million settlement for the lapses in the criminal justice system that allowed her kidnapping and captivity to go on for so long.
The J.C. Duggard story is a chilling reminder of the importance of vigilance and the need for improvements in the monitoring of convicted criminals. It also highlights the incredible strength and resilience that humans are capable of in the face of unimaginable adversity. J.C.'s ability to heal, rebuild her life, and help others is truly inspiring. They said they, they got him. And pretty much that's all I needed to hear is that they got him. On April 1st, 1988, in the small town of Fort Wayne, Indiana, eight-year-old April Maine Tinsley was playing with her friends just two blocks away from her home. With spring in full bloom, children in the neighborhood were eager to enjoy the outdoors. April's innocent laughter and playful demeanor were a familiar sight to her neighbors. As April began her short walk home, she suddenly vanished without a trace. Her mother, Jeanette Tinsley, became increasingly worried when her daughter failed to return on time. The sun began to set, and Jeanette knew something was terribly wrong. She immediately reported April missing, and a massive search operation was launched. The community banded together, with hundreds of volunteers combing the area for any signs of the little girl. Neighbors, friends, and even strangers offered their help, desperately hoping to find April unharmed. But despite their best efforts, there were no leads or clues to her whereabouts. The search continued for weeks, and the case garnered national attention. The heart-wrenching search came to an end on April 29th, just a few weeks after her disappearance. April Tinsley's lifeless body was discovered in a ditch along a rural road in the nearby town of Spencerville. The young girl had been brutally assaulted and murdered. The gruesome discovery sent shockwaves through the community, leaving residents reeling in disbelief and horror. Detectives from the Fort Wayne Police Department, as well as the Indiana State Police, began an extensive investigation. They collected evidence from the crime scene, interviewed potential witnesses, and meticulously followed every possible lead. Yet, despite their efforts, they were unable to identify a suspect. April's murder would go unsolved for years, leaving her family and the community with a lingering sense of unease and frustration. Two years after April's murder in 1990, the killer resurfaced with a chilling message. On a barn door near where April's body was discovered, a crude scrawl appeared. The message read, I killed eight-year-old April Marie Tinsley. I will kill again. Alongside the disturbing message, there was a drawing of a young girl and the words, ha ha, were etched beside it. Investigators examined the message but they were unable to conclusively link it to April's killer. The eerie message served as a horrifying reminder of the unsolved crime, casting a dark shadow over the community. Despite this chilling development, the case eventually went cold. Over the years, investigators continued to pursue leads, but nothing seemed to bring them closer to solving the murder. That is, until 2004, nearly 16 years after April's death, when the killer resurfaced in the most disturbing way. In the summer of 2004, four notes were discovered by young girls in the Fort Wayne area. Each note was accompanied by a used condom and contained a threatening message, claiming responsibility for April Tinsley's murder. The notes also included Polaroid pictures of the sender's body and a chilling warning that the girls would be his next victims. These twisted messages brought the case back into the spotlight, instilling a new sense of fear and urgency within the community. Investigators analyzed the DNA evidence found on the condoms and confirmed that it matched the DNA found on April Tinsley's body. With this new evidence, they now had a direct link between the notes and April's murder, but the identity of the killer remained a mystery. In an effort to generate new leads, the FBI released a profile of the suspect. He was described as a white male in his 40s, living or working in the Fort Wayne area. They also speculated that the suspect had likely had previous contact with law enforcement and might have a history of sexual offenses. Despite this information and the renewed interest in the case, the trail went cold once again. For over a decade, the April Tinsley case seemed to be at a standstill. 
However, a breakthrough finally came in 2018, thanks to advancements in DNA technology and the rise of genetic genealogy. Investigators were able to build a family tree of the suspect using DNA samples from public genealogy databases. The groundbreaking technique had been successful, used in other high-profile cold cases such as the Golden State Killer. Investigators were tirelessly tracing the suspect's family tree through generations eventually narrowing the list of potential suspects. The genealogic research pointed them towards two brothers, John D. Miller and his brother. Authorities began to surveil both men, hoping to obtain DNA samples that could either confirm or rule them out as suspects. Eventually, investigators managed to obtain DNA samples from both brothers by collecting items they had discarded in public. The analysis confirmed that John D. Miller's DNA matched the DNA found on April Tinsley's body, and the condoms left with the threatening notes. On July 15, 2018, 30 years after April's murder, John D. Miller was arrested at his home in Grabille, Indiana, just a few miles from where April's body was discovered. When questioned by authorities, Miller confessed to the abduction, assault, and murder of April Tinsley. He also admitted to writing the threatening messages found on the barn door and the notes left for the young girls in 2004. Miller's confession brought an end to the decades-long search for April Tinsley's killer. In December of 2018, he pleaded guilty to murder and child molesting charges. On December 21st, 2018, Miller was sentenced to 80 years in prison for his heinous crimes. The April Tinsley case is a tragic reminder of the devastating impact that unsolved crimes can have on families and communities. For 30 years, April's family and the people of Fort Wayne lived with the pain and fear of knowing that her killer was still out there. The eventual resolution of the case serves as a testament to the perseverance of law enforcement and the power of modern technology in bringing justice to victims and their families. The resolution of the April Tinsley case also provided hope for other cold cases. Advancements in DNA technology and genetic genealogy continues to offer new opportunities for solving long-standing mysteries. It's a reminder that justice, though sometimes delayed, can still be achieved and that the timeless efforts of investigators and the unwavering hope of families can ultimately prevail. That's it for today's episode of Crime Recall. If you found this case intriguing, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and share your thoughts in the comments below. For more stories like this, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated on our latest episodes. If you know of any other cold cases that deserve attention or have any suggestions for future episodes, feel free to share them with us. Until next time, stay curious and stay safe.